uh, first welcome all of you. Thanks for coming. And it's a, it's a great turnout. And of course, we're all looking, uh, really looking forward to, to Rachel's talk today. Um, uh, I'm going to, uh, just let me mention who I am in case you uh, aren't you know, one of the students who signed up or one of the faculty that, that know me. I'm Bob Kaiser. I'm a professor in the geography department studying the political geography and geopolitics of ethno-nationalism, particularly in the Soviet Union and the successor states. Uh, recent work that I've done has included work in the borderlands between Russia and Estonia, and particularly the Russian communities living in Estonia following independence, and more recently, the rising demands for autonomy and the protest movement leading up to and including the 2019 uprising in Hong Kong. So again, sort of borderlands and the political geography and geopolitics surrounding these issues. Um, I'll, uh, I'll mention a couple of additional background things and then uh, introduce you to uh, Rachel Oswald and then we'll, we'll get going. Uh, today's sponsor is the Institute for Regional and International Studies National Resource Center or IRIS NRC, um, which supports and enhances global awareness and inspires informed thinking about the complexities of our world. Uh, the center provides resources and expertise uh, to K-12 uh, and post-secondary educators, students, and the community at large. Um, and IRIS NRC is a, a partner in the, um, Oh, sorry, that's, that's next. <laughs> Thank you also to our uh, co-sponsor for today's film club, the Pulitzer Center for Crisis Reporting, which raises awareness of underreported global issues through direct support for quality journalism across all media platforms and a unique program of education and public outreach. The University of Wisconsin-Madison is a Pulitzer Center campus consortium partner there. Uh, S.C. Lenchner uh, will be running tech support along with uh, John, our, our, our grad student assistant. Uh, if you have any challenges, use the chat function to contact uh, S.C. And, uh, and or John and we'll, we'll get that sorted out. Uh, we are recording today's event and sharing the link and digital resources in a post event email. Uh, you will only show on the recording if you're uh, microphone is turned on to speak, just as background information. Uh, please do try to enter any questions you have in the chat for uh, the Q&A portion during the last 15 minutes, and you can be adding those questions at any point during the, uh, the talk uh, with Rachel. I'll also read the um, UW-Madison Land Acknowledgement Statement. Uh, the University of Wisconsin-Madison occupies an ancestral Ho-Chunk land, a place their nation has called De Jo since time immemorial. In an 1832 treaty, the Ho-Chunk were forced to cede this territory. Decades of ethnic cleansing followed when both the federal and state government repeatedly but unsuccessfully sought to forcibly remove the Ho-Chunk from Wisconsin. This history of colonization informs our shared future of collaboration and innovation. Today, UW-Madison respects the inherent sovereignty of the Ho-Chunk Nation, along with the 11 other First Nations of Wisconsin. Now, let me introduce you to today's speaker. Rachel Oswald is a reporter for Congressional Quarterly or CQ Roll Call, where she covers foreign policy through a legislative lens. She covers congressional oversight of the State Department, national security law, the foreign aid budget, nuclear treaties and proliferation, national uh, human rights concerns and humanitarian crises. Rachel has reported from South Korea, Japan, Austria, Russia, Kazakhstan, and the Dominican Republic. She previously covered nuclear weapons issues for National Journal and is a past fellow of the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting, the International Reporting Project, the Japan Foreign Press Center, and the National Endowment for Democracy. Rachel is the chairwoman of the National Press Club's 
Press Freedom Committee and is a graduate of George Washington University where she majored in Middle Eastern studies. Uh, so please join me in uh, welcoming Rachel. And Rachel, I'm gonna turn this now over to you. Thanks, thanks so much. That might be the nicest and warmest introduction I've ever had, so thank you. Um, well, welcome everybody. I appreciate you giving me some of your very valuable attention tonight, um, and um, I hope to make the most of it. Um, I hope at least some of you were able to, as part of this April Film Club, uh, watch um, De um, Death of Stalin, the movie uh, that I suggested be the lead in tonight's conversation. Um, I suggested that, I, I first saw it myself for the first time last month, and it was, it was very timely and horrifying. And I thought it would be good to frame the discussion um, to remind us all that while the film was definitely satire, it still remains the case today that many powerful nations, most notably Russia, continue to concentrate unchecked power in the hands of dreadfully fallible and small-minded leaders. And that has real world implications for global peace and security for all of us. So with that said, um, can we bring up the, the presentation? Great. So um, tonight's topic is Russia, Ukraine, perspectives from the East, West and global South. Um, in thinking about how to frame tonight's lecture, I thought that it would um, uh, be beneficial to you all to spend a lot of time on how non-Western countries are thinking about this war. Um, and when I say non-Western countries for the purposes of tonight, I'm referring to um, countries that are not inside NATO, not in the European Union, um, not the US or Canada or the other wealthy democracies in Asia that have joined in in the sanctions push against Russia. Um, we all here in the West um, have, I believe, been mostly consuming news coverage from Western news outlets, which have mostly focused on the Western responses to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And while that makes sense, um, I do think it leaves out um, really important context about how developing countries in the Western Hemisphere, in Africa, in places like Southeast Asia, how they are viewing the conflict because it's not just how the West views the conflict that will ultimately, you know, kind of when all the dust is settled, determine what the lessons learned for this unprovoked war of aggression will be for other would-be aggressors. And we know, unfortunately, that there are other would-be aggressors who are watching what is happening now with laser eyes, and they are looking to see how harshly Vladimir Putin pays for his war of aggression against Ukraine. So um, can we go to the next slide? Great. So what's at stake? Nothing short of the post-World War II norm that war, no, wars of conquest, wars for territorial expansion are verboten. Um, you know, um, I included this quote from a, a, a new foreign affairs article because I, I like the how it encapsulates um, kind of just really how common it was before World War II for there to be wars of aggression, wars of territorial expansion. In fact, that was the norm for human history. Um, and in the post-World War II era, we were trying to have a new norm that such wars were unacceptable and the international community would respond to such wars unanimously with economic retaliation to deter further such wars. And, and that's kind of what's at stake right now. Um, other things are at stake, um, massacres, massive human rights violations are at stake. Um, China, Taiwan, that's, that's part of it, but you know, the dividend of World War II was that we had the United Nations and the United Nations, its founding basis for existence is to create structures that disincentivize wars of aggression and allow and, 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 and are able to resolve wars of aggression before they become wars of aggression. Um, 
I would like to also um, at this point distinguish between uh, threats to sovereignty and territorial integrity, because I think particularly in the news coverage of what's happening in Russia, Ukraine, sovereignty and territorial integrity are kind of you know, thrown around in the same sentence. And while they are aligned, um, so sovereignty is part of territorial integrity. Um, they're not always treated the same by the international community. Um, since World War II, there have been repeated um, assaults against countries, um, sovereignty. Sovereignty basically means the right of any country to decide its own form of leadership and how it conducts its foreign and economic policies and its defense policies and its alliances. Um, we have seen um, in, in, in this century, including multiple times by our government, the United States, we have seen um, attacks on other countries' sovereignty when we have attacked other countries in an effort to um, expel, topple, um, their governments with a government more to our liking, frankly. Um, that was the case when we invaded Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, that was the case when the United States led a NATO military intervention in 2011 against the regime of Muammar Gaddafi. Um, those were assaults on sovereignty, but they were justified as being necessary um, and, and people disagree and they still disagree about whether they were justified. But one thing was clear was that those were not attacks against the int territorial integrity of those countries. The, the United States was not trying to rewrite the boundaries of Iraq and Libya and Afghanistan. Um, and so they were less objectionable to other countries in the United Nations. Um, in part because that norm of, of respecting territorial integrity was being respected. Um, and so uh, can we go to the next slide? All right, other long-term questions. Um, how, right now China um, is providing tacit moral support for Russia's invasion of Ukraine. It's not giving uh, Russia the weapons that Russia wants, um, and it's not doing much to undermine um, the Western imposed. I mean, it's doing some things, but it's not flagrantly trying to undermine the sanctions imposed by the West. It's trying to avoid direct economic consequences to its own economy, but it is providing um, important diplomatic cover for Russia um, at the United Nations and even more critically through its own very powerful um, disinformation propaganda apparatus, which is um, just echoing Russian disinformation around the world at every end. And uh, that is having um, real world impacts. Um, but so Russia's, the way Russia is um, supporting Russia's, the way China is supporting Russia's war of aggression out of one side of its mouth, while still holding to what has been its long standing um, uh, kind of reverence for the principles of sovereignty and territorial integrity is a real inherent contradiction, and I will say a complete hypocrisy. And this is important because one of China's go-to criticisms of the United States, when the United States criticizes China's human rights records is, well, what about what you did? What about ism? Um, China and Russia um, really work to do all they can to highlight inconsistencies on the part of the United States and its allies in their foreign policies, um, while maintaining that, you know, China, for all of its, you know, imperfect human rights practices, is still a reliable, consistent country. Um, and this is a glaring inconsistency that is being done very publicly. And while the West sees it and is, and is not happy about it, I do think it's important how other countries, particularly former colonies, view uh, China giving uh, succor to Russia. Um, Russia is acting as an imperial aggressor right now. Um, how do former colonies feel about China? which also has lots of anti-imperialist criticisms for the United States. How do they feel about China um, also defending the imperial actions of Russia? Um, another uh, key question, um, 
at some point, there is likely to be a peace settlement between Russia and Ukraine. And I'm not going to speculate about, you know, what might be in that. But um, what I do think will be crit critical is how the international community and not just the wealthy democracies of the West, how do they respond to President Vladimir Putin's expected efforts to rehabilitate himself. I mean, nobody expects Russia to come back to the G7. Nobody expects Russia to be um, welcomed in European uh, capitals anytime soon. Probably never, honestly, I don't know, but probably not. But um, what about other, other multilateral forums? Um, will Putin be allowed to attend the G20 in November where Indonesia is hosting it and has not disinvited Putin as has been urged by the West? Um, will the major uh, emerging economies of South Africa, China, India, and Brazil, the so-called BRICS, will they welcome Putin to any of their future summits? Um, and also, um, Will Western businesses that uh, fled Russia um, out of fear of sanctions and also a moral principle, will they return to Russia and how quickly, um, how quickly will, will Russia be able to rebuild its military, which is being uh, gradually depleted by the war in Ukraine um, and is under strict, strict international uh, not international, Western sanctions right now. How quickly can Russia rebuild its military? I think the takeaways of that will have a lot of bearing on the lessons learned by China's uh, Xi Jinping and other fledgling um, autocrats. Um, it will be whether they decide that the price that Russia paid was too high for them to contemplate similar um, wars of aggression or um, violent, um, uh, violate, flagrant violations of international norms. And finally, um, what will the United States do to resolve the own inherent inconsistencies of many of its foreign policies? Um, in trying to rally international support against Russia and for Ukraine, the United States has really been making moral arguments. There are arguments of national self-interest, security interests, protecting the norm against wars of aggression in there. But for the most part, Washington is framing this through a moral lens. And that's really, really rallying for NATO, for the European Union, it really is. But other countries outside of the West have a more jaundiced view of the United States and, and its own history. Um, and if the United States continues to have a policy of basically, we have exceptions to these rules, um, it will continue to give um, Russia and China to a lesser extent openings to accuse it of hypocrisy and undermine that high-minded morals argument that um, can actually be really compelling when it's done from a position of, you know, strength and not double standards. Um, and I'll get to some of that later, um, some of the inconsistencies later in, in the presentation. Um, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so how are non-Western states viewing the war? Um, let me go back up. Um, let's take a slightly deeper look at how key non-aligned countries and regional blocs are viewing the war. Um, India is a key emerging country, the world's biggest democracy, and it plays a crucial role in the United States' developing strategy for managing the long-term threat of China in the Asia Pacific. Um, India has abstained, been neutral during all three UN General Assembly votes on the Ukraine war. 
Uh, this is in line with India's previous positions uh, during other times of Russian aggression. This isn't a change of policy for India. India is continuing its status quo, uh, which, you know, for, for any of you um, foreign policy history students, you'll remember India was famously part of the non-aligned movement uh, during uh, the Cold War. Um, uh, for the most part, Indian domestic polls show that those surveyed approve of their government abstaining and condemning Russia at the United Nations. This is likely due in no small part to how strongly India's populist right-wing media, which is consumed by most, most Indians, um, rather than like the English language publications, which are consumed by the so-called elite, um, India's populist right-wing media has argued that President Joe Biden is wrong to criticize India's neutral position on the war, in part by arguing that Russia was provoked by NATO, and two, the United States bungled its own withdrawal from Afghanistan very recently, which directly contributed to the deaths of many innocent Afghans. Therefore, where does the United States get off on wagging its finger about other countries causing deaths of innocents? So again, what about ism? Um, oh, also conspiracy theories. Um, conspiracy theories are promulgated by Russia that are picked up um, by social media in India and by those right-wing news outlets that Ukraine has biological weapons laboratories funded by the United States. Um, uh, and that um, the, the massacre in Bukha uh, is a hoax um, and that there are neo-Nazis um, you know, operating you know, uh, throughout Ukraine. Um, all of that stuff uh, plays a role in shaping Indian public opinion um, about what's going on in Russia, Ukraine. Um, also, most critically, I think, India, is heavily, heavily reliant on weapons imports from Russia. Um, Russia is considered the more affordable option for India and you know, India's weapons relationship with Russia spans decades going back to the Cold War. Um, India has been because of in part the threat of US sanctions imposed as a result of the 2014 Russian annexation of Crimea, India has been trying to reduce its reliance on Russian weapons imports, but that takes time. Um, and India is hoping for, for, for waivers from Washington to allow it to continue importing key Russian defense systems. Um, India doesn't feel like it has room to compromise on this right now because it feels like it has um, very serious security threats on its borders posed by Pakistan and, India, and China. Um, and, and that's gonna be a real area of tension between Washington and India. Um, but it seems right now that like Washington gets that. Washington has been making more public, Washington has been doing more recently to publicly pressure India to kind of pick a side, but Washington also recognizes that, that India, India's position on Russia, Ukraine is a longstanding one. India's position on Russia is a longstanding one. And I think Washington really doesn't want to do anything that would push China away from the emerging um, informal alliance, I say informal alliance carefully in the Asia Pacific of um, Australia and Japan and the United States and India to kind of handle China. Um, so this is really the United States trying to walk and chew gum at the same time when it comes to India and the Russia-Ukraine war. Israel. Um, Israel is another problematic country for the United States when it comes to Russia, Ukraine. Israel did not vote at the United Nations to condemn Russia's invasion, although it did vote more recently to expel Russia from the Human Rights Council. Um, otherwise, Israel has not taken decisive steps to punish Moscow. Israel explains this by saying, you know, it really relies on Russian acquiescence in Syria for Israel to carry out airstrikes on missile and weapon depots in Israel, in Syria that Israel uh, fears could be used to threaten Israel. 
Um, additionally, there are large populations of Russian and Ukrainian Jews who might look to immigrate to Israel because of the war, and Israel will want to prioritize their ability to safely travel. Um, and so it will want to take steps that won't infuriate Russia and won't infuriate Ukraine. But increasingly, Israel is being pressured by the West to pick a side. In Africa, um, the Russia-Ukraine war has been really illuminating to international affairs analysts um, that I've spoken with um, because it has revealed just how busy Moscow has been in sowing influence in African countries when so much of the worry in recent years in Washington has been about China's growing influence in Africa through its Belt and Road uh, foreign aid projects, foreign development projects. Um, African countries represented roughly half of all of the abstentions at the United Nations on the vote condemning Russia's invasion while 28 countries voted in March to condemn Russia's invasion, 17 African countries abstained while no votes were recorded from another eight African countries. Um, reasons for that, um, I would say, you know, during the, during the Cold War, um, the USSR um, did provide a lot of explicit support to uh, liberation movements in countries like South Africa and elsewhere. And, and that is remembered in part because those liberation movements still hold a lot of power and influence explicitly and implicitly um, in African capitals. And um, they're, not, they're not so easily to be pushed into the, the Western camp, even though um, Africa by and large is largely Western leaning in its sympathies, um, in its aspirations. Um, uh, ambitious young people um, in Africa aspire to immigrate to the United States and other wealthy democracies. They don't aspire to immigrate to Russia. Um, and I also wanna be clear here to distinguish that even though public comments have been made by leaders in Uganda, Kenya and South Africa that have criticized um, Western hypocrisy um, when it comes to Russia and Ukraine, and um, you know, and maybe um, given credence to, to Russia's grievances about NATO, um, there's a difference between what African leaders are saying, um, and many African leaders lack legitimate dem democratic legitimacy, um, and what you know the African populace feels. Um, Broadly, um, there is a lot of sympathy to the plight of Ukrainians, um, and many Africans are viewing Russia's war on Ukraine through an anti-imperialist, anti-colonialist lens. Um, but um, the issue is that they don't always have um, a strong voice in their governments. Um, and at the same time, um, you know, Russia, we're seeing in Africa um, the dividends of, of Russia's, you know, long-term policy of exporting weapons and food and fertilizer and energy technology to developing countries. Um, this hadn't been something that had gotten a whole lot of attention from the West um, in the years that it's been happening. Again, some of it traces to the Cold War, but um, some of it is much more recent and has explicitly been promoted by Vladimir Putin to expand Russia's influence in the developing world. But because the West, Washington, has been so focused on um, the perceived uh, influence threat from China's Belt and Road Initiative, um, the extent of some of these um, Russian exports in really crucial domestic sectors like food and energy um, has been overlooked. Um, how, again, and this also relates back to what I said before, is if these countries want to maintain and resume their imports of Russian energy and food and weapons, that will play a role in how quickly Russia is rehabilitated or not after any eventual peace settlement. Um, developing countries, including in Africa, including in Southeast Asia, including in South America, 
are largely sympathetic toward Ukraine, but they resent perceived double standards by the West in how they are supposed to, they feel, prioritize what's happening to Ukraine over their own national interests. You know, again, um, we, we're still in the middle of a COVID-19 pandemic. That pandemic was ruinous to the economies of much of the developing world, um, in part because of the self-protective measures imposed by Western countries. Um, Western countries were quick to snap up all of the first contracts for the highest quality vaccines against COVID, leaving countries in Africa and Asia to wait for lesser quality vaccines to come on the market and become available. Western countries also imposed, um, you know, for public health reasons, uh, strict travel bans that meant a lot of foreign workers from the developing world had to leave the country. And so the remittances that those developing workers had previously been sending home shriveled up. Um, tourism shriveled up. And at the same time, the foreign aid that these countries had um, been getting from the United States, from the European Union, from the United Kingdom, that also did not rise to meet the need of the global 19 pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic, because the West chose to prioritize protecting its own industries and its own people. And so now um, when, West, when developing countries are told, you know, or asked, we want you to impose sanctions on Russia, we want you to stop importing products from Russia, there is a feeling of that's not fair to us, we're so fragile, we're still coming out of the pandemic. And also, oh wait, Europe is still importing oil and gas from Russia, you know, and so there is sympathy for Ukraine, but also frustration for a renewed feeling that the West prioritizes Westerners and wants the rest of the world to do so too. But when the victims are brown people, whether they're Syrians or Afghans or coming from Africa and they want and they're they're seeking refuge in Europe or the United States, you know, they they don't get that same hearing and sympathy. So this is all part of the the tension um, between how strong of an international response that there will be for, for Russia. Can we get to the next slide? Okay. <laughs> um, I liked this cartoon. <laughs> I don't know, I did. Um, I think it's because I like bears. Um, what does this mean for China and Taiwan? I think here in Washington, where I live and work, everybody's been consumed by this. It's been the topic of a ton of panel discussions. Um, and, and I get it. Like, it's really, it's really interesting. Um, I do agree that if World War III is likely to break out, it's still likely to break out over a potential invasion of Taiwan. Although Russia is really pushing, pushing the envelope right now. It definitely is. But I do think it's too soon to tell with any level of confidence what the impacts for Chinese President Xi Jinping's appetite for carrying out an invasion of Taiwan will be based on the fallout from the Russia-Ukraine war. Why do I think that? Because of everything else I previously said. You know, it depends on the final tally and not just by the West, but by the international community of how high a cost Russia is made to pay for its invasion. Um, I would say, broadly speaking, the Chinese public, I think there was a there was a survey, the Carter Center recently, like in the last couple of days, um, did a poll of Chinese internet users, which are not are not all Chinese, but do represent a majority of Chinese. Um, and it found that 75% of those surveyed believe that supporting Russia's war in Ukraine is in China's national interest. And higher support for Russia was notably associated with higher levels of education. Um, but also notably, 60% of those surveyed think that China should keep its support to Russia confined to moral rhetorical support, diplomatic cover, and not extend to actually arming Russia the way the United States and its allies are arming Ukraine. 
most Chinese see this conflict through an anti-Western and specifically an anti-American lens. Um, Xi Jinping, um, while there was some reporting initially that China was very taken aback by Russia's invasion of Ukraine, um, China has now come back round and is giving full-throated support via its um, state propaganda machines to Russian disinformation. Um, Facebook, Twitter, other Western social media outlets have throttled um, Russian propaganda accounts um, ability to disseminate their claims via social media. And what China has done is it's basically taken, you know, word for word, you know, translated them, you know, these, these Russian disinformation stories about Ukrainian neo-Nazis and um, biological weapons laboratories. And it's also now repeating them. Um, and, oh yeah, it has many more times um, by an order of magnitude, the reach via Facebook that Russia's um, propaganda outlets had before they were throttled. Uh, can we go to the next slide? All right. What does this all mean for international organizations and uh, the the need for UN reform? Um, uh, I like that I included this quote here um, from a recent op-ed written by the Brookings uh, Kamal Dervis and Columbia University's Jose Antonio Ocampo. Um, because, you know, it, it just puts it out there. What is the purpose of the United Nations? Why was it formed? What is it meant to do? And in short, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has shown that the Security Council is illegitimate and ineffective in fulfilling its main reason for existing. Um, it's, it's really hard to figure out how to, how to fix that because um, you would need to have a whole new UN charter. And I, I don't know that that's achievable. Um, nonetheless, there have been um, a flowering, I would say, of proposals since the invasion for ways to try to reform the Security Council and um, put more checks in places for the um, who, what, the, what are called the, 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 the P5, the, the five permanent members of the Security Council. And um, you know the, those, those countries are the United States, the United Kingdom, France, China, and Russia. Um, the interesting thing about some of these reform proposals is that in any other time and place, the United States would have vehemently argued against them. Um, and so pro likely would have its, its geopolitical allies on the council, the United Kingdom and France, and so would China. Um, they would all essentially take away power and room for maneuverability from the P5. Um, and um, particularly on the American right, um, you know, that would be seen as an attack on sovereignty. And that's, that's, that's a huge deal here in Washington. Um, many, many conservatives right now continue to be inherently distrustful of, of the United Nations, its reason for existing. Uh, they see it as not worth all of the, the, the serious amounts of, of money, billions of dollars over the decades, many billions of dollars over the decades. The United States has invested in the United Nations, but you know, at the same time, you know, Russia, Ukraine has really kind of emblazoned the stakes for everybody, you know. Um, I do think if these reform proposals were to gain, gain, gain traction, it would, it would result in a, a, some very serious debates here in Washington. Um, I think it's a very long road to go. Um, but, um, but, it, but it's worth noting. And the Biden administration is even supporting some of, to my mind, the weaker proposals for reform, but I'll, I'll run through a couple of them for you. Um, one proposal would be to add a clause to Article 27 um, of the charter that would permit a large double majority um, representing, depending on how it's phrased, 66% of all member countries of the United Nations or 60% of the world's population that they could override any veto from a P5 member. Um, another proposal would um, take away Security Council members' power to veto referrals to the International Criminal Court. 
And um, the Biden administration is backing a reform proposal from Liechtenstein that would require any P5 Security Council members when they use their veto to go before the General Assembly and explain why they decided to do that. Right now, uh, P5 members, and it's usually uh, the United States or Russia who most commonly use the veto, um, don't have to kind of really make an explanation, you know? I mean, sometimes they do, but it's kind of just like, you know, not really taken seriously. And they don't really have to worry about justifying themselves in the court of public opinion of the General Assembly. Um, just a couple words on NATO while I'm in, the, in this section. Um, um, Ironically, Russia's, not ironically, unsurprisingly, when you, when you carry out a war of aggression, unsurprisingly, when you carry out an attack on your neighbors, um, those neighbors' fears that you might attack them are strengthened. So Russia's fears of NATO expansion are becoming a reality now, as Finland and Sweden are taking steps to begin the process for applying for formal alliance membership. And that actually has a lot more teeth, I think, than whether Georgia or Moldova or Ukraine were to join the alliance, because um, even as Ukraine has been incredibly impressive with its ability to fend off Russia's invasion, um, it's really Finland um, that would be the real catch for the alliance because of how powerful and capable Finland's military is. And they also share a long border with Russia. Um, in the United States, even as support for NATO remains overwhelmingly strong and bipartisan, repeated attacks um, by former President Donald Trump and his supporters on NATO as a system of freeloaders are taking a toll in the Congress. And it's not clear what that would mean should Donald Trump be reelected to the presidency or a Trump-like successor succeed Joe Biden. Notably, uh, during a recent vote in the House a couple of weeks ago, roughly one third of the House Republican caucus voted to oppose a symbolic non-binding resolution supporting NATO. While that's just a third of House Republicans, it is also three times higher roughly than the Republicans who voted to oppose a similar pro-NATO measure when the House voted on it in 2019. So the takeaway is that even as support remains overwhelmingly strong under the surface on the far right, criticism is building to NATO. And that I don't know what that I don't know what that adds up to. I don't, but it is worth bearing in mind. Um, can we have the next slide? Okay. Um, again, another quote that I liked again from uh, Tanisha Fazala of the University of Minnesota that kind of encapsulates. Um, the stakes of what the takeaways will be for the international community for how Russia's invasion of Ukraine is ultimately viewed. Um, we seem to only have more conflicts um, percolating, and some of them, um, some of them could be regional conflicts like Armenian Az Azerbaijan's fight. Um, I don't think it got that much attention um, from, from the global community when it happened last year, but other, other um, territorial disputes, particularly um, in the Asia Pacific between China and its neighbors are going to be um, ones with um, really serious potential devastating implications um, if they in fact become hot wars. Um, other takeaways, um, you know, as a journalist, I give I, I pay a lot of attention to the war of information, to disinformation, to propaganda, to efforts to throttle free and independent reporting, to shape shape the um, public information sphere, and and that's been very in interesting to me in my own professional biases of how I conduct my work. But this has also been kind of validating because we are seeing you know in real time how important the war of information is because if populations around the world believe conspiracy theories to be true, that the United States has funded biological weapons laboratories in Ukraine, um, that there's lots of neo-Nazis running around in Ukraine, which again is led by a Jewish president, um, then, then that whataboutism, that, that hypocrisy, then that really muddles 
the moral argument for the West that, and for the international community that wars of aggression are wrong, that we must respect human rights, we must not attack civilians. Um, this has real world consequences, particularly when you have weak governments, weak national governments that lack a lot of security and a sense of legitimacy, and they're going to be vulnerable. I don't wanna say vulnerable, but when your public has the ability to hold you to account, whether because they believe in conspiracy theories that are that are boulder dash or whether because they want you to adhere to global norms and respect for you know human rights that has influence on the way those countries make decisions you know whether it whether it's participating in sanctions you know notably uh japan and south korea are joining strongly so is singapore so is Taiwan. They're joining strongly in the Western-led sanctions on um, Russia when they didn't do that when Russia annexed the Crimean Peninsula in 2014. That's because there has been an evolution in those countries in the um, nearly decades since then, since 2014, where they do see more of a threat of China and they want to send a, a deterrent signal to China, but they are also um, evolving toward a more um, liberal democratic view of, of upholding of, of their own their own role now as developed democracies and their responsibilities to participate you know in the upholding promulgation of, of, of liberal democratic values around the world um oh and again uh the united states has staked out the moral high ground in this conflict um it's, you know, that this is a conflict between autocracy versus democracy, um, but its own shortcomings when it defends or makes excuses or even uses, you know, the UN Security Council, its veto power to, for example, protect Israel from resolutions that would rebuke it for its, um, its building of settlements in the West Bank land that was seized during a war, um, which is, it's, that's not legal under international law. It's not legal to acquire land through war. Um, it's not legal to annex land, um, but Israel has done that. Um, you know, the United States, you know, literally, you know, it defends Israel and it, and it has reasons for doing that. It couches them in national security reasons and protecting Israel's democracy in a region full of autocracies, et cetera, et cetera. Those have been the historical reasons, but it becomes more difficult now to say Russia's annexation of the Crimean Peninsula and maybe more, more Ukrainian territories, you know, in the Donbass region is, is absolutely unacceptable, but we're going to continue to use our veto power um, to protect Israel, the Security Council, for its annexation of um, East Jerusalem. Um, and furthermore, um, when uh, Donald Trump in 2020 uh, formally recognized um, Morocco's annexation of the Western Sahara, which it had annexed decades ago, but it had never been acknowledged, the international community had refused to acknowledge the annexation. But when Donald Trump agreed to recognize it, um, in exchange for Morocco uh, joining the Abraham Accords and extending diplomatic recognition to Israel. That's all part of, of, the, of the calculus right now, particularly in the Middle East, where there is a ton of hedging um, right now vis-a-vis um, -vis Russia, Ukraine. And um, that I think brings me um, to the end of my remarks. Let's, let's go to Q&A if we could. Okay, everyone. Um, I'm not seeing anything in the chat now. Rachel, if, uh, if anyone would also like to raise their hand um, through the reactions button on your Zoom, uh, we can get that going. And it looks like we have a question coming in from Jeffrey Barkwell. So go ahead, Jeffrey. Yeah, can, can, can you hear me? In the past, when China, when Russia annex, annexed Crimea, China was against it. But was 
so what is China's stand, stance on the Russia's invasion of Ukraine? Are they are they in for, for it or, or are they against against it? Um, Russia, I mean, China has kind of had it both ways. They they don't call it a war. You know, they don't recognize it as a war. They they're calling it a, a special military operation. What they have urged is that there be a peaceful resolution as quickly as possible. But they are not blaming Russia for the war publicly, officially. They want they want an end to the fighting, but they don't they're not blaming Russia. Um, that's what they're saying officially publicly. And then we also have everything that they're doing through their um, official uh, propaganda, state government um, news outlets to kind of repeat and amplify Russia's uh, uh, disinformation claims. So why is that? Why is Russia not, um, you know, blame, blaming, why is China not blaming Russia? Um, I think that, you know, I think initially China in, in, in February 24, when, when, when Russia invaded, I think initially China was taken aback. I think it was surprised, even though there had been that very high profile summit at the Beijing Olympics a few weeks prior between Putin and Xi Jinping, um, where they announced you know, deeper, deeper cooperation um, among several er um, in, throughout several areas. Um, I think China feels like ultimately having Russia be strong serves China, particularly as um, it, it distracts, it distracts Europe, it distracts the United States from focusing resources um, on the Asia Pacific and also having a strong Russia that is not um, a pariah country in the international system helps China because then China has another powerful country that that it can form a block with. They're not a formal alliance, but but ultimately I think China sees that it is in bed with Russia. Not a formal alliance. They don't want to take on, they don't want to take on the consequences that Russia has incurred, but Xi Jinping would prefer to see a strong and robust Russia as a stronger counter to the um, solidifying alliance by the West against China. Why can't we just, uh, co why can't we all just coexist? I don't know. I think it'd be great. I don't think it's in human nature and I think that's really depressing, but it's really hard for humans to coexist historically. Mm -hmm. We can do it, but historically, historically wars of aggression have been our norm, you know? Remember, remember education is, is a key, could be a key to end that. I, I agree. I agree. I think access to, to good information is key. Yep. And, and being raised rightly, you know, with love and all that. That helps too. Any, any more, any more, can I ask any more or should, or should I just put them in the chat? Let's see if someone, if I, let's see if we can get a few more questions from others. And I think in the meantime, if you want to put questions in the chat, that works great. So if we don't have any, we'll definitely pick yours. And speaking of which, Rachel, are you okay going a few minutes over? Yeah. Uh, in a time just so you can collect a few more? Yeah. Hi, Jennifer, go ahead. Why don't you go first and then Eleanor follows. Okay. Um, hi, Rachel, thank you so much for this talk. It was fascinating. When I saw the announcement, I was really um, a little bit surprised with the juxtaposition of the film and then your remarks for today. Um, I have to admit, I have not recently rewatched The Death of Stalin. I did watch it when it first came out. I thought it was body and offensive and hilarious. And even if it was not factual, it told so much truth on so many levels. So um, since you shared that you watched it recently, I was just hoping you could give us your, uh, you know, your hot takes on this film. <laughs> um, I was watching it 
and I'm not, a, I'm not, I'm not a deep, I'm not a student of Cold War history. You know, like I know the basics, I know the basic things that happened during the different Soviet leaders, but I wasn't a student of it. So I'm watching the movie and I'm like, the writers made this up. And then I would like, you know, go to Wikipedia and, you know, and verify it and be like, wait, this really did happen. What, what the movie did was it compressed the time frame <laughs> for events that happened after the death of Stalin from like what took place over weeks and months to basically what happened in, you know, 48 hours. Um, but those things did happen for the most part. Yes, they were exaggerated for comedic dramatic effect, but that is how Stalin died. He might have been able to live had, you know, his, his, um, you know, uh, the people, the people around him sought medical care, but they were, they were terrified that they'd be accused of harming him, or they were incentivized to have him die because they wanted to take power themselves. So like his cult of terror that, that allowed him to, you know, reign for so long, I think also contributed to his untimely death. Um, and then just, just the way they had those death lists and they really were arbitrary and they really were arbitrary. Like it's horrifying how it's just, it's just disturbing. And it's, it's disturbing to know that there is still a strong tendency in countries around the world to put so much power in the hands of, of one person and morality aside, that person could be a lunatic. They could be unhinged. I think sometimes they are unhinged and there are not strong mechanisms to hold them to account when they are making decisions against the interests of the state, let alone the people. And um, I find that baffling, but it's, it's, it's reality. And I, I, I am still trying to kind of come to terms intellectually with, with why we continue so many governments continue to tolerate and prefer that. You know, I mean, democracies are really hard work. I get it. They're really hard work. There are a lot of achita and frustration, but they do provide a few checks and balances against unhinged leaders. Now, I'm not going to talk about our own recent experience with, you know, whether we should invoke, you know, Amendment 20 and all that, but uh, <laughs> no, maybe we should talk about that. Let's not talk about that. <laughs> so I hope I answered your question. Thanks, Rachel. Eleanor, please. Hi, thank you so much for this. Um, I've misplaced my video camera, so I'm just in the dark right now. Um, but this has been really wonderful and really enlightening. Um, and uh, my focus is more on the West and Western thought. Um, and so I'm curious to know um, if any strategies, you had mentioned that there's a lot of hypocrisy with the West saying, um, you know, you can't just walk into a country and 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 take it over. Um, how are there strategies um, that the West has been using to sort of combat that narrative of um, the the whataboutism mm -hmm. uh, that have been working um, in in areas where where the whataboutism is uh, particularly effective? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. Um, I can't give you, since I'm not privy to like the diplomatic behind the scenes negotiations between countries uh, who are not in the Western Bloc, but to get them to come along, I can just say the way the Biden administration is framing this is, well, one, they prefer not to talk about it, but if it gets brought up, you know, they will try to highlight the fact that it's not apples to apples, you know, um, Russia carried out an unprovoked, you know, war against its neighbor, um, similarly to the way Saddam Hussein, you know, invaded Kuwait you know, um, at the beginning, uh, in, in, after the, um, in 1989, resulting in the, in the Gulf War. Um, the Gulf War was um, supported overwhelmingly, I think near unanimously by the international community. They supported the US effort to successfully expel Saddam Hussein's forces from Kuwait and reinstall the legitimate government of Kuwait. Um, so they're, they're, they're trying to, to kind of focus on the black and white 
immorality of what Russia did, you know, and, and that that's true, you know, um, it, it, these arguments about what aboutism, they have the most salience, you know, in the Middle East, in Africa, in countries that have recently experienced, you know, uh, what they feel like are double standards in the way, um, you know, uh, military interventions are carried out against against their governments, um, and 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 also, and I think um, emotionally, um, the victims. How are the victims treated? You know, the Syrian victims of Bashar al-Assad, Assad's war, got got a lot of sympathy from the West and Germany and a few other European countries did welcome in large numbers of refugees, but you know. In the United States, when there was a proposal um, by Barack Obama to welcome in, um, I think it was 100,000 Syrian refugees, that became a rallying cry by conservatives led by Donald Trump. You know, that's the kind of uh, to not to, to 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 not allow a single one in, and that's the that's recent memory for for the populations of these countries that are hedging, and it's it's hard. It's like what Russia did to the Ukraine is, is absolutely wrong, but how much should we have to pay the consequences for Russia's attack on Ukraine, the economic consequences of Russia's attack on Ukraine when the West is perceived to have been directly or indirectly responsible for a lot of harms to, to, the, to innocent civilians in the 21st century. It's hard. I, I don't envy the Biden administration of its job. That, that's a real hard one to argue. Okay, thank, thanks, Rachel, and thanks for the questions. We've held Rachel over a bit. Rachel, do you want to look at the chat and see if you want to take on either of those additional questions? Mm -hmm. um, what will happen to NATO and Ukraine um, and the conflict with Russia if Trump or a Trump-like successor succeeds Joe Biden as president? Um, and that question comes from Jeffrey Barkdell. Um, well, you know, so, so the NATO alliance um, maintains its credibility um, a couple of ways. Um, and, and, and a US president can, can impact that credibility um, in, in a number of ways. I would say that Donald Trump hurt um, the credibility of the alliance by speculating whether the United States would honor the, the Article 5, the, the, the reason for being of the alliance that an attack, an unprovoked attack on any member country will be treated as an attack on the entire alliance. And so by throwing doubt about whether the United States, by far and away the most powerful member of the alliance, would honor that bedrock principle of the alliance um, made a lot of European countries really worried. Um, and I think it gave some confidence to Vladimir Putin about what he could get away with, though I don't think that he thought he could get away with invading Ukraine on Joe Biden's watch. I do think he wasn't expecting quite as harsh a response. I think he was expecting a response more the way the, Biden, the Obama administration imposed limited sanctions on Russia for its annexation of Crimea in 2014. But the Congress right now is trying to take steps to ensure that no, no Donald Trump that comes back into president or Trump-like successor could pull the United States out of NATO. Interestingly, this is a little bit of a, of a, of a constitutional um, quagmire. The, the Constitution requires the Senate by a two thirds overwhelming majority to ratify any treaties, but it is silent on what Congress and the Senate's responsibilities are when a US president wants to unilaterally withdraw from treaties. Um, in, there, in the past, US withdrawal from treaties had been supported by legislation passed by Congress, but the constitution doesn't require that. And increasingly in the latter half of the 20th century, and then even more so in the 21st century, 
um, we've seen presidents, mostly Republicans, withdraw from treaties that have been approved by the Senate. So in theory, a US president could pull the United States out of NATO. And um, that is that has that is that is being paid attention to by some lawmakers who want to pop who are developing legislation that is waiting a floor vote in the Senate that would require the advice and consent of the Senate. That means Senate, Senate approval before any president can withdraw the United States from NATO. Um, now that still has a ways to go and there could be constitutional challenges raised to that. But even if, even if a future Donald Trump like president doesn't withdraw the United States from NATO by um, ending, ending military support for things like um, our deterrence initiatives that we have in Eastern Europe um, that include lots of drills um, with, with with European partners and, you know, in the case of Ukraine included before the invasion, a lot of training, a lot of training, they could end that. Congress would fight them on it. But as I mentioned before, a growing number of Republicans in the House, but not the Senate, are kind of becoming, they're not opposed to NATO, but they don't want to be quite as supportive of NATO, I would say. Um, and that could be enough to bungle any effort to pass legislation that would bind the US government's hands on how it engages with NATO and the robustness of that engagement. That was a very long-winded answer, but I am a congressional <laughs> reporter. I'm sorry. That stinks. Great. And, and great job, Rachel. I think um, it's probably time to thank Rachel um, for uh, a really fascinating talk um, and really wide ranging engagement with uh, the consequences and the near future um, that we're looking at in terms of this conflict. Uh, and then um, to, uh, to call it a day, everyone. Thank you very much.